Hey everyone, my name is Uri Cohen. I'm a product lead for the platform team at Elastic. And today I wanna to talk to you about our plans for a serverless Elastic Cloud. Now you heard some of that in Ken's keynote, but what I wanna to try to do in this, in this session is actually dive a little bit deeper into those plans, give you a sense for what we're doing and how we're architecting this uh, solution. Um, and just give you more information about it. Hopefully you're gonna be as excited as I am about it when the session ends. So um, before we do that, I wanna dive into the current product offerings of Elastic. I think this will help us level set and understand the need for a serverless Elastic Cloud and why we're doing it. Um, so currently Elastic is available, our products are available across two deployment models. The first one is self-managed. And in this literally you download the software, Elasticsearch, Kibana, Logstash, and install and manage it yourself, whether on-premises or in the cloud provider of your choice. Uh, you can also use one of our orchestration, orchestration products, ECE, Elastic Cloud Enterprise, or ECK, Elastic Cloud on Kubernetes, which allows you to orchestrate and manage uh, multiple Elastic Stack instances, instances in your environment. Uh, and then we have Elastic Cloud. Uh, Elastic Cloud is our cloud solution. Uh, we're gonna dive a lot more into it in a second. Uh, what we basically do there is provision all the hardware to uh, run and support your Elastic Cloud deployments. And then we orchestrate those deployments um, on, on those servers. That means that we install them, we manage them, we allow you to very easily upgrade your software, size it, and so on and so forth. So a lot of uh, awesome capabilities to help you manage your Elastic Stack deployments more efficiently. Uh, now, if we kind of look at, you know, the, the history and like where Elastic Cloud, you know, came from and how it got to be where it is today. Uh, so in, in, we launched Elastic Cloud in 2015. Uh, at the time, it was just a handful available in just a handful of Amazon regions. Uh, and gradually, we started expanding it. In 2017, we've expanded it to support Google Cloud. Uh, that year, we also launched our first support for marketplaces in the form of AWS Marketplace and then expanded to the GCP and Azure Marketplaces. Uh, I'm going to touch on the benefits of marketplaces in a second. Uh, and then 2019, we expanded to Azure and launched a number of uh, initial Azure regions. And then that year, we also beefed up our product offerings with uh, APM support, application performance monitoring for the observability solutions allowing you to instrument your application, get deep insights into its performance and bottlenecks, and then uh, really introduce a number of uh, foundational capabilities for a security solution in the form of endpoint protection uh, and SIM, which allows uh, basically a security analyst to uh, detect threats and hunt them using hundreds of pre-built uh, threat detection rules. Uh, then 2020, we introduced support for natural language models and the ability to uh, implement semantic search uh, through the use of vector similarity search. Uh, so this allowed us to actually uh, import external na natural language models from uh, websites like Hugging Face and PyTorch, uh, use them within Elastic to, to implement much, much more uh, you know, accurate and semantically uh, uh, correct search. Uh, and then over the years, we, we improved that as well and, and kind of allowed you to combine the good out of the vector similarity search and the more traditional BM25 models, giving you best of breed search results. Uh, 2021, we introduced auto scaling for Elastic Cloud, allowing you to auto scale your Elastic Search nodes uh, based on storage and uh, auto scale your machine learning nodes based on the uh, machine learning uh, uh, jobs workloads. Uh, and then, you know, where we are today is uh, a pretty massive scale for Elastic Cloud. We ingest more than two petabytes of data a day uh, across all the deployments, uh, support tens of thousands of Elastic Search clusters, uh, you know, around 20,000 customers. Uh, so pretty robust operation uh, across all the three cloud providers and, you know, 53 regions. Uh, we're going to touch on that in a second. Uh, now, let's kind of dive into serverless and, and talk a little bit about why we need it, right? So I mentioned that um, Elastic Cloud, um, what we do with Elastic Cloud is, is provision uh, the underlying hardware and essentially orchestrate the stack on top of it. Uh, so a lot of super powerful things we do there, like, um, you know, single click uh, upgrades of Elastic Stack versions, um, ability to easily size your cluster, like scaling them up, scaling them down. 
collecting monitoring data. So making the administration of, of the Elasticsearch a lot easier for you. Uh, but um, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, burden is still maintained or still like need to be carried by the users. Uh, that includes, for example, sizing. You know, um, how big does your cluster need to be? That is something you have to determine. Um, as I mentioned, upgrades are super simple to initiate, but they are still user initiated, right? So it needs to be an explicit, an explicit action that the user takes. Um, you need to understand shards and understand the, um, you know, the, the notion of availability zones and replicas and so on, right? And so a lot of our users actually do appreciate that because it gives them a lot of control over how their applications are deployed and the workloads are deployed. Uh, but then uh, um, another set of users, which is also pretty big, actually prefers uh, that they don't have to care about that. Like they don't want to know about shards and nodes and things along those lines and prefer for Elastic to uh, to manage everything for them. Uh, just exposing a set of uh, API endpoints and, and UIs to interface with them, right? And this is what serverless is about. It's about Elastic kind of assumes those extra capabilities and just makes the service uh, super easy to use for our customers. Obviously, like, you know, there's a certain de degree of, of control and, uh, and power that is lost with that. Uh, but again, for a lot of users, this is exactly what they want. So this is what the serverless offering is about. Now, as we kind of, you know, started to design the offering, uh, we defined the traits that we wanted to support. Um, and, and the first one is we wanted, again, to be simple as possible to use, uh, not incur any administration burden for our customers. Uh, they don't have to deal with provisioning, sizing, scaling, uh, upgrading the Elastic stack, like nothing of that, you know, of that sort. Um, just a you know, hands-off experience, again, an API endpoint, a UI to, uh, to interface with that, and that's it, right? That, that's what we want to achieve. Uh, we want it to be cost-effective, um, uh, both for us and for our customers. Like, if if, if the serverless offering is going to be five times more expensive than uh, the current offering, um, then, you know, it's probably not going to be used by a lot of people. And so we want it to be very, very cost effective. Uh, so this will allow us to actually price it in a way that would make sense for all of you. Um, then another very important aspect, um, the Elastic Stack has been developed um, uh, over the last uh, 12 years, right? Uh, two years before Elastic, Elastic the company was set up and then 10 years uh, since then. So there is a lot of goodness in it, right? All the awesome capabilities in Kibana that I mentioned before, uh, the solution UIs, discover, dashboards, like anomaly detection, you know, all the awesome search capabilities, aggregations, like all of that. So, so we don't want to lose that. We want to be able to support all of those awesome capabilities um, in the serverless offering. We want it to look and feel like the Elastic Stack. And then lastly, um, much like the Elastic Cloud offering today, we want to support, you know, any kind of workload from like really small search use cases for, I don't know, your, your you know, school website or something like that, all the way up to, you know, observability and security use cases that, you know, literally ingest petabytes of data a day, right? So have the the solution support all these use cases and, and do it in an efficient way. Now, um, when you started off, like a lot of people would, you know, come to me and just say like, hey, like, isn't, isn't serverless just auto scaling? Like you have pretty awesome Elastic Cloud offering, just like implement auto scaling on top of it and kind of like you're done, no? And and the answer is not really, right? Like we want it to be a lot more expansive and robust than just auto scaling on the current offering. I mentioned, um, you know, uh, some of the things we'll need to support, right? And, and you know, just implementing auto scaling actually doesn't, doesn't, doesn't really get us there. Uh, the first thing we wanted to do is make Elasticsearch much more cloud native, right? Elasticsearch was designed 12 years ago. Um, and at that point, uh, you know, public cloud was just in, it, in its infancy. Um, and, you know, things like blob storage and like other capabilities were not really like widely used, right? So uh, we think we can design Elasticsearch in a way that can be, um, you know, a lot more cloud native and a lot more easy to operate in the cloud environment. Um, we want to create a unified experience um, across the cloud 
and the stack offerings like today you know it, it's actually pretty well integrated but it, it does feel like you know there's a cloud console and there's kibana and so we want to blur the lines between the two and make it feel more like a SaaS experience you know you have like one single set of users that have access uh, to any number of workloads uh, we want to reduce the operational overhead um, because if we are to take um, all of the uh, management burden from customers, right? The, you know, like scaling clusters and upgrading them and so on. Like we need to be robust enough uh, to do it efficiently because if we don't, it's going to just like cost a lot of money and, and you know, not many people would want to use it. Um, and then lastly, like it's it's not just Elastic, Elasticsearch, right? It's, uh, it's the entire stack. It's all the components that surround it. Like Kibana, fleet server for managing uh, our unified agent technology. Uh, APM server for ingesting open telemetry and APM data and a bunch of other services all need to be fully managed and just available for customers to use versus, you know, them having to care about the provisioning and sizing of them, right? So, um, you know, we kind of set a much more, uh, I guess, uh, you know, robust and bold vision for serverless uh, than just auto-scaling uh, the current architecture. So with that, I want to take a, a bit of a deeper dive into the architecture itself. Um, you may recognize these slides from the keynote. Uh, what I'm gonna do here is like dig a little deeper than the keynote and explain some of the aspects of, of the new architecture. Um, so I'll start with Elasticsearch. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, Elasticsearch was architected some 12 years ago, right? Um, and it's a very robust architecture, right? Uh, at the core of it, we have uh, uh, the notion of shards and indices, right? So every index can be divided into multiple shards. Uh, this gives us the ability to scale indexing, right? Distribute shards across multiple nodes, uh, thereby allowing them access to more compute. Um, and then high availability is achieved by replicating data from um, you know, the primary shard into the replica shard. Uh, the way data is, is replicated, um, so every document that comes into Elasticsearch um, and goes into a primary shard, shard gets indexed in that primary shard uh, into a Lucene segment, then gets replicated into replica shard and gets indexed there as well into uh, a copy Lucene index. Uh, and so this architecture is pretty robust. Um, you know, you can, like I said, you can scale indexing uh, if you split to shards. Uh, you can scale search by creating more replicas. It's highly available. So if one of the nodes fails, uh, you can fall over to uh, to replica node. And so um, it, it kind of carried us uh, uh, quite a long distance. Uh, but it does has a, does have a few drawbacks. Uh, the first drawback is that it's it, you know it's pretty costly in ingestion. Um, so as I mentioned, documents get ingested uh, and indexed uh, both in the primary shard and in the replica shard, right? That means like you actually do the same operation twice um, on two nodes. And that's pretty redundant. That's that that costs you CPU, which you can actually save. Um, you have to maintain for high availability, you have to maintain multiple copies uh, of the data uh, on the host itself. Um, as we know in cloud environments, there are cheaper ways to store data than storing them on VMs, right? Like Bob storage, for example. And so we think we can cut the cost down by, by removing that constraint. Uh, another trade that is you know, often overlooked in this architecture um, is that um, the compute, the CPU is actually shared between inge ingestion or indexing and search. So if you have, um, for example, uh, super high indexing throughput that may impact your search performance, or if you have a lot of concurrent search requests that will impact your uh, indexing performance because both of them are actually served from the exact same nodes. And what typically happens in these cases is that customers over provision uh, on compute to be able to accommodate for spikes in either indexing uh, or search. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell, you know, like some of the drawbacks. Uh, the other thing that I mentioned before moving on is that in terms of um, you know the, the data importance, right? I mentioned data tiers before, right? So this like initial architecture um, actually doesn't allow uh, customers to trade off cost for performance. Like all data is treated equal, whether it's old or new, and kind of search from the same disks and the same CPU, right? Uh, and that's where data tiers come in, right? That's kind of the 
1.5 version of the architecture, right? So as data ages, you can move it across the tiers. Uh, warm is actually much more dense uh, storage and, and nodes than than the hot than the hot nodes, and then cold is is kind of like warm, uh, only it doesn't have any replicas. It's actually backed by an object storage, and then the game changer, like I mentioned, is actually frozen, where um, you can actually serve searches uh, directly from the object storage, and, and thus achieve uh, storage efficiency. Uh, so the data tiers model is very, very powerful, uh, but it, it does have the drawbacks on its own, right? So as data ages, it actually needs to move between those tiers. Um, that takes time, right? So there's a delay between the tiers, and that costs a lot of money, the data transfer that happens. Um, and so, you know, it, it's not like the most optimal solution you can think of. And and by the way, a lot of our customers actually like don't really understand the tiering model. It's, it's not very simple to understand um, and to use. So while it's very powerful, there are some drawbacks to it. So with all of that in mind, we kind of set to redesign uh, a cloud native Elasticsearch. Uh, we call it stateless Elasticsearch. And in its core, um, what it does is push the state, the data itself into the object store, uh, S3 and others, uh, and uses that as a system of record. Um, so very simply, we have two types of nodes. We have indexing nodes and search nodes. Uh, data comes into the indexing nodes, gets indexed into Lucene segments locally, and then uh, the Lucene segments gets push, get pushed into the object storage. As they get pushed to the object storage, uh, the search nodes are notified, and then they pull uh, the Lucene segments down into the search nodes and make them available for search. Um, now, for search nodes, they actually don't have to pull all those scene segments. So remember that capability that I mentioned with searchable snapshots, where we can actually search directly into the blob storage. So uh, search nodes can actually like pull just part of data, or even not pull any data at all, and search everything directly in the blob storage. And so this notion of data tiers doesn't need to exist anymore, because really, if you want to trade off cost for performance, all you need to do is reduce the amount of data that is cached locally in the search tier. Right, so this is a big win for this architecture. Now, a few more things you see here is that uh, because we have separate tiers for indexing and search, these can be scaled separately. So if you have high indexing throughput, just add more indexing nodes, right? And they will just push more data into the object storage. This would not affect the search tier one bit. Um, because everything is backed by the object storage, as we index data, we don't need to, to index it twice uh, on primaries and replicas. We just push it down to the object storage, and that's our backup. And the object storage itself is, you know, practically limitless in terms of in terms of storage capacity. So it really allows us to store a lot of data without incurring the associated compute cost, uh, like in the previous architecture. So effectively separating compute from storage which is something that a lot of our users have been wanting to do for a while. So super powerful architecture, uh, very excited about it. That's already like an advanced implementation phases. Um, and just to share with you some of the performance uh, characteristics, right? This is a benchmark that we've done uh, a couple of months ago with this new architecture. Um, and you can see two things. You can see that the stateless architecture uh, with the same amount of hardware can actually uh, index a lot more documents, 75% more documents to be more specific, because again, no CPU costs are incurred uh, on replicas, right? Like, so, you know, essentially you're using half the CPU for indexing. Um, and then in terms of, of CPU utilization, you can see that on the right-hand side that the CPU utilization is actually much lower. And, um, you know, in that way, it's much more cost efficient. Again, going back to one of the goals that we had uh, initially, uh, to uh, to improve the cost efficiency of the solution. So super exciting news. I'm super excited about the state of this architecture and we're kind of working our way through it right now. Now, if I get back to the, you know, broader picture, so, you know, there's the stateless Elasticsearch architecture and then on top of it, we're going to have a services layer that is, you know, going to serve um, all the peripheral capabilities uh, to Elasticsearch like machine learning, anomaly detection, uh, fleet for managing uh, your your unified agents, uh, the APM service for ingesting uh, open telemetry and APM data, synthetic service, and a bunch of other services. And then there's a presentation there in the form of Kibana and the Cloud Console. 
as I mentioned before, um, you know, we want to blur the lines between them and kind of, you know, unify them eventually into a single platform experience. Um, so hopefully this gives you a good sense of the logical architecture of the system. Uh, what I want to do next is touch on the physical architecture and then a little bit about what it's going to look like from user perspective. So let's start with the physical architecture. Um, you know, um, this is all going to be running on Kubernetes, uh, I guess, unsurprisingly. And um, with the serverless offering, we're going to introduce the notion of projects. Uh, think of a project as a collection of indices. Um, initially, it's probably going to be backed by stateless Elasticsearch clusters. Uh, but in the future, it doesn't have to be this way, right? So from a user perspective, this is, you know, abstracted away. Um, in terms of how it's run physically, um, there is a Kubernetes cluster that runs what we call our global control plane, uh, which exposes a project's API. Uh, there is a project's controller. Controller is a, is a well-known Kubernetes term. Um, and this controller actually receives project API requests or you know looks at project API requests and kind of materializes them um, in the actual uh, clusters, Kubernetes clusters where the deployments run. And um, you can see here that every region may have one or more Kubernetes clusters. Uh, these clusters contain uh, those uh, shared services that I mentioned um, and the actual, you know, uh, uh, stateless Elasticsearch clusters and Kibana instances that back the serverless projects, right? So this is kind of a physical view of, of everything. Um, again, from a customer perspective, all you really see is projects and indices um, and the APIs that allow you to access them. Um, and that's it, you don't really need to care about anything else. So obviously we're gonna have a lot more sessions um, and share a lot more details about this architecture, but I thought it would be a good kind of, you know, first look at what this is gonna look like. Um, now from user perspective, in terms of information hierarchy, um, what we have today in Elastic Cloud is the notion of organizations. Um, and an organization is a container for any number of elastic stack deployments, elastic search clusters, Kibana instances, fleet server instances, and so on. Um, and um, users typically belong to one organization and have access to those deployments, right? That's how it works today. Um, when the serverless offering becomes available, um, it's actually just going to be another option in Elastic Cloud. So instead of having access to uh, Elastic Cloud deployments, like in the what we call the classic model, you're also going to have access to serverless projects uh, through this API that I mentioned and through a dedicated UI. Uh, I'm going to show a little bit of that in a second. Um, and, and those projects are typically going to be uh, associated with a project type that's going to correspond to one of the three solutions we support, right? So if you want to build applications on top of the Elasticsearch APIs, you're going to use the search product type, project type. If you want to uh, observe your products um, and implement APM or um, synthetic monitoring or Kubernetes monitoring, you're going to use observability. And if you want to implement SIM or protect endpoints or protect your cloud workloads, then you're going to use the security project type, right? And all of this is going to be available uh, you can use any number of projects, any combination of those projects uh, as part of your Elastic Cloud organization. So if you're already an Elastic Cloud customer, uh, the serverless offering is going to be available for you as soon as it's released. And lastly, you know, from user perspective, uh, we aim for it to be as simple as possible. Obviously, this is, this is just an, a very early mock-up of what things are going to look like. Uh, so you'll have a choice between the classic and the serverless models. Um, uh, same choice of cloud provider and region as as, as you do today. Um, we do acknowledge that data locality is a thing and it's important. So um, you know the service offering is not gonna uh, gonna remove that capability from Elastic Cloud. Um, and then, like I mentioned, being able to select the uh, the project type based on the use case you want to implement. And so this is just a glimpse for what uh, the user experience is going to look like. Uh, again, over time, we're going to share a lot more details about that. Um, so with that, um, this brings the session to an end. Hopefully I gave you a good sense of where we're headed um, uh, with, with serverless at Elastic. Um, and I hope that uh, you know with, with the data you learned in this session, you're just as excited as I am towards the, the, you know, the serverless future of Elastic. 
um, and stay tuned for more news from us um, on that regard. Thanks for watching until now and have a great rest of your conference.